Hey everyone, this is kind of a break in the regular uh, programming here uh, with my real flow tutorials. In this um, first of many, I hope, videos, I want to promote the will to kind of start looking under the hood and working a little bit with technical direct direction and kind of how things work uh, inside of Maya when you, uh, when you want to start doing things procedurally or kind of start thinking about doing things more effectively. And so in this first video I wanted to introduce you to the node editor and how that works. So that's going to be very basic entry level thing uh, as long as you have some basic knowledge in Maya. So I will kind of assume that you have that. Uh, so in this simple scene I have three objects and I was just want to show the node editor right now. I have it as a tab here but you, if you don't you can go to Windows node editor and then you can kind of dock it down here if you want to. So the first thing to notice is that whatever you're doing inside of the node editor um, or in the scene I mean it's going to be reflected by default in the node editor. So as uh, you keep adding objects to your scene the node editor is going to keep getting populated with these objects. So it's uh, good to either, you know, you can um, you can disable auto add to graph on create if you want to and that's going to stop that from happening or you can just accept the fact that it's going to be a little messy like this and then once you actually want to get into action on an object you can use these three buttons here. So um, I could, for example, clear the button to get rid of everything. I can select an object and click the plus button to, uh, you know, just get the selected object added to the graph, and then I can start laying down my nodes. Uh, or if you have several objects on the graph and one of them needs to go for some reason or it's uh, cluttering your view, you can just select it and uh, click remove selected node from graph. So it doesn't delete it from the scene or anything like that. It's just filtering out what you're going to see inside of the graph. Uh, so let's take a look at something like this sphere here where I've done a few operations on it. You can use, you notice the difference when I clicked plus, I only got the actual node and its corresponding parent in this case, uh, or the child I mean, uh, because what I'm actually selecting here in the view is the transform node of that object and if I enable shapes here in my outliner you can see that the child node is actually the shape node and that's usually the one we're more interested in and for that reason there's the opportunity of under display uh, entirely disabling transforms so you won't get transforms and we don't really need them that often we will need them in some cases coming up but a lot of times you can do without so you can uh, click to add just the object or what you can also do is you can use these three buttons uh, which will let you show input connections, in and output connections, or only output connections. Let me show you wh what that means. So if I click input and output, we're going to get on the p-sphere, which has a smooth and an extrude, we're going to get everything that feeds into it and everything that feeds out of it. So if I click the sphere shape and only do the output connections, you may guess that whatever is in on the right hand side is going to be uh, shown. And uh, then we can also do the other way around. If we undo that, we can do input only, which is going to show the, if I select the poly smooth face node, which is not visible anywhere here in the, in the scene uh, by default. So, and, uh, but you can select any operation, any node in here. And if I just map the input connections, I'm only going to see the initial polysphere node. So it's good to kind of take a step back and uh, think about uh, what a what nodes are and what kind of gets added here. So if I if I just click the new sphere icon in this case, you're going to see that I have a P sphere, a polysphere node. This is the actual node that mathematically uh, creates the sphere primitive, and it has the properties for radius and for how many uh, subdivs you want it to to have. So if I turn on wireframe shaded, you can see that I can change my subdiv axis and height. And then there's the shape node. And the shape node is kind of like the place where, um, where the geometry information is stored. So if there's nothing feeding into it, then it's kind of locked uh, in a way. 
And the easiest way to illustrate that is by going, you're probably aware of the, the command inside of Maya called uh, delete uh, history. So if you delete history, everything that's fitting into it is going to be deleted. But we're still going to have the shape, but we can no longer go back and change the amount of divisions. Um, Let's uh, cook something else up here. Let's uh, just, um, for example, add an extrude. Oh, this UI on Linux is not impressive at all. Uh, <laughs> but if I do that extrude, for example, and uh, let's just click the sphere and map it. So you'll see it kind of creates a bit of a circular dependency here, but you can really just ignore this because this is just for the fact of doing that uh, for for the manipulator really, uh, so I could actually take this connection and, and delete it, and nothing's going to happen. But uh, it would be harder to manipulate it after the fact. So, but now it's a little easier to read. Um, so what is what is going on here really? Any operation, if you go to the channel box, you may be uh, n you may be used to seeing operations as inputs here. Uh, you may have thought to yourself previously that, well, I triangulated or I smoothed or I extruded, but now I've kind of kept working and there's no way of going back and changing that. Uh, I've even had, you know, like when I was teaching um, in classrooms, I would sometimes, you know, have like a student who's, you know, like I smoothed it, but then I realized I didn't need to smooth it so uh, yet or something like that, or I changed my mind, so I just went and put the divisions to zero, but the smooth node is still in the hierarchy. Well, let's uh, explore here. What if we just click and delete? You'll see that there's no longer a smooth node here. You can actually kind of undo things by going back in the construction history. This is what construction history is. Uh, you know, like a string of uh, pearls or node operations that all connect into uh, the geometry. So at any point we can delete, we can, you know, unhook things and bypass them. So I can go output and plug that into uh, the input of this node. Um, so I can just take the output and plug it straight into the in mesh. So now I kind of circumvented that extrude phase, which would be the same thing as pretty much deleting it. But sometimes when you delete uh, a node, uh, then things will kind of get deleted downstream or upstream. So it can sometimes it can be good to get into the practice of kind of experiencing how to reconnect uh, these things. But I'm kind of getting sidetracked here. I hope you are still with me. Uh, I wanted to show you that you can also lay out the graph. So if you click that, everything is going to be arranged nice and uh, clean. If you have a lot of things going on, uh, then we have these uh, few uh, buttons here, which uh, are pretty good for when it comes to making your graph more readable. So in this case, for example, let's say that I have no need whatsoever in seeing what attribute is connected to the in mesh, because that's kind of like uh, default behavior, uh, I guess, uh, is showing you kind of the, like the properties that are connected. So you can uh, click the first button here. It's going to hide attributes on selected nodes. So if I select this one and hide, then we only see that there's some sort of connection. We don't really know what. Uh, and we can always hover and see that if we need to. Second button is uh, show connected attributes, as we had it before, pretty much. And the third one is uh, show primary attributes, which are uh, pretty much most most attributes. Uh, so you can see in case you need to connect something else in here, uh, that's good. And you can also click in this little box here and filter things out. So if I needed only the mesh something, input mesh, uh, I could filter out so it's only mesh. So it's easy because some nodes have a lot of attributes. And the fourth button is show attributes from custom attribute view. I wouldn't say that I necessarily actually know what that means. Um, I guess you can kind of make presets. Uh, don't quote me on it. I don't really, you know. Um, yeah, and then you can turn off that little filter uh, view. And you can also toggle between the, the swatch size. Sometimes it's nice to have bigger swatches. Uh, I should also mention that these operations are available through hotkey 1, 2, 3, and 4. So it's usually 1, 2, 3 are the ones I would use. 
Um, what's next? Uh, bookmarks, you can kind of, if you have a huge node graph, you can create and uh, edit bookmarks and you can kind of do that in a way so you can jump between different places in the graph. Typically, I don't use that very much. Uh, and then you can uh, choose to, let's see, these are, this is kind of another filter toggle. So display any shapes connected to shading nodes or shading groups, display only shapes that are connected, or uh, this do not graph any shape nodes attached to shading nodes. So that will get rid of any shape node that has a shading node. Uh, we're getting a little too specific here. Not something that I play around with too much. And we saw before that we can pick in the options to auto add to graph on create. This does the same thing as clicking this little padlock here. Traversal depth is something we can get back to later. Uh, we're getting a little um, more advanced here. Uh, but kind of pertains to how much information you want to see on how many levels, especially when you're doing uh, containers and things like that. Uh, next up is toggling the grid visibility, pretty uh, self-explanatory, and also you can snap to grid if you like. So instead of moving this freely around, you may want to be a little more organized and kind of snap to grid lines. That could be nice. Uh, last but not least, you can uh, do listing in, in here. So if I wanted to, for example, show everything that has... Th this is like a, like a search word thing. So if I... Like I don't know the exact name, but I know that it has... You know, start with something. So I put an, uh, a star for that or an asterisk. And then I type sphere and enter. Um, and then it can end with something else. I don't know what it will end with. So now it has like, it can start with anything, have the, n the word sphere in it and end with anything um, as an example. Or I can say it can um, start with the word poly or and end with anything, wildcard, and that will mean poly sphere in this case. Uh, or if you haven't known the exact name and just want to find it in a huge graph, then you can use uh, the search for for that. It's also worth pointing out that you can uh, do several views in here. So um, usually the way I use the node editor is I usually actually forget this uh, and turned um, turned on. So I will work with the scene and it will get populated with a lot of um, things in here. Uh, and then eventually I realize, okay, now it's time to get to work and kind of set up some nodes. Um, then you can create a new tab if you like. And I will come into that new tab and I'll only drag in the things that I actually need to work with. So I might, you know, only work with this network here, for example. And I only have the nodes related to that uh, type mesh, for example, or SVG mesh in this uh, case. Um, and, you know, like make sure that, uh, that no new nodes get added in here. So I could kind of have this as my go-to. So I will work on the... Uh, SVG imports here, whatever I need to do that, maybe I need to add in, you know, like a triangulate node in here or something like that. Uh, that could easily be done. So um, you can have different tabs for that and the different tabs have different settings for that padlock. So you can have the scene automatically add new nodes, uh, but in this very tab, you can kind of lock it down so nothing, nothing gets in there and clutters your view. But uh, enough talk about a lot of different things. Let's just take a look at a super basic example and just, uh, you know, connect things, really. So what would you typically do in the node editor? I mean, what you do is you connect things in order to make <laughs> your life easier, I guess. So um, one example would be, let's say you're creating some kind of a geo and you need to sync these values. So you may want to change the width to, I don't know, 32. And then let's say you're going to change the height to the exact same value. So you on, always want this to be proportional. So then we could kind of avoid having to change both values by connecting the two together. You cannot, you, you don't, you're not restricted to only connecting different nodes to each other. You can connect, connect the node's output to uh, a node's input on another attribute. So let's see how to do that. 
You can take the subdivision's height. I just pressed the three key, by the way, to just list all of the attributes. And then I can take uh, the, um, the output of the width just by clicking on that output port, and I'm plugging it back in to the height. And you can see that it turned yellow now because this is no longer interactive. This is now controlled by something else or driven. And as I scroll my width property, the height property gets updated. So I want to show you another example. So let's say that I uh, am using, uh, let's say I have a scene with some objects uh, disappearing into the distance. I just created this uh, the fastest and mo easiest way I possibly could. Uh, and we're going to be using depth of field in this scene. So let's say that I enable that on the camera now. We can actually see that inside of the viewport. So uh, let's see which button it is. It's that one. So we're doing, uh, nope, it's not that one. <laughs> Sorry. I kind of get a, a little bit uh, which button does what because they're not annotated. So we could go sh uh, render lighting. That's actually in this dialogue, I think. So I'll just do... Or maybe I just need to enable it on the camera, actually. So let's say we're doing depth of field. Yes, cool. Uh, and we need to figure out, like, how big is the focus distance? Uh, or maybe I just want to be able to uh, animate that focus distance. You know, it's, it's easy to find out where the focus actually lies. We can do display, heads up display and we can do object details and we can see the distance from the camera for this very object is 29 so if i select my camera and i go back and i'll set it to 29 you'll see it's in focus but what if i wanted to be able to keyframe this it's going to be a little messy if i all the time have to come back to the camera attribute editor and i need to uh, keyframe this value so let's say we want to set up like a focus pull and automate this process. Uh, the way you do that is let's clear this and I'm going to select the camera and add it in here. So I have the shape node of the camera, which is what we need. And you can see that the focus distance is what we want. So we can type focus. And how do we fetch the value um, that we are going to feed into that? Well, let's just put an object in here that we're going to use uh, for this purpose. So I'm going to create a locator because that's not going to be rendered. So it's nice to have a locator. And since I'm by default adding nodes in here, uh, that has been added. But this time we actually need those transform nodes. So I'm going to enable transform because what we want now is positions. And positions are not stored on shape nodes. They're stored on transform nodes. So I can actually get rid of the shape node of the locator because the only thing we need from the locator is the position. But now we need to actually calculate. And how do we calculate? Well, if you know the name of the node that you need, you can do Nuke Houdini style, hit tab, and just type. So let's say I wanted to multiply something. I could start typing multiply, and then I can see, OK, multiply divide node. Um, and uh, uh, that's not the case here. So we click the leftmost button and enable the create node rollout. This is very like shading node focused, but uh, all the nodes you are going to want are in here. So the utility nodes are we're going to need in this case. You can see that um, uh, that multiply node, for example, you can also filter here. So that multiply node is in here. Um, a bunch of different, you know, inverse, uh, add, Things like that, but the one we really need in this case is the distance between. And we could kind of figure out that because, you know, we knew that we needed the distance. So I just lay down a distance between node. And I can hit the 3 key to twirl it out. Uh, or in this case, 3 key didn't really do much for me, so 4 key is going to take two inputs, two points really two distances. So I will feed in not a point but the translate value because that is kind of like the value that we have, the x, y, and z translate. And that is um, a vector, a value with three 
components. And you can see that these two match up because they have the same color. So if we were trying to connect, for example, um, inverse matrix, you can see that there's different uh, different data types. So those won't line up easily. Sometimes you need to convert things or just maybe twirl out. And if I were connecting, you know, only the Z value to a value with only one component, then maybe I could break it out like that or use some kind of node in between. So now I've connected it, so I can press the 2 key now because it was getting in the way. So I only get uh, what I really need here. And I can twirl this down and I can connect the translate of the second object into the point. And then I hit the 2 key. So we could try, there's no real way of like debugging this. You could actually kind of get, you know, you could... Um, print out the value with some scripting and whatnot. You could connect this to something else if you needed to. Um, let's say I, you know, I could connect the distance to the translate value of this node in order to just see it printed out. But what I'm going to do really is just plug the distance into the focus distance. And hopefully nothing should change because it's roughly where we want the focus. But what we're going to see if we pull on that locator is that this is now going to update to accommodate our focus change. I don't know if it's visible. Let's go to the f-stop and kind of pull that down and really exaggerate this effect. Is this one of those things that is a little inverted? No, it's not. Okay, so let's have a really small f-stop. And now we can pull this around and we could animate it if we wanted to. And that's kind of how you would get started in laying down nodes and using uh, utility nodes and connecting things up uh, to your advantage. And that doesn't necessarily mean you actually have to have, you know, an object in between. Let's say that uh, this was, uh, you know, sometimes you just want to uh, you want data to flow through your scene in a way uh, that is hard to do without creating, you know, sometimes you can get away with constraints, but what if I had, let's say that these two were cobwheels, it doesn't really look like cobwheels now, but uh, if I lay them out like that, um, the Y value, if they were cobwheels of this wheel, would drive uh, the Z value of this wheel. Um, and if I wanted to to lay that out, we already know the answer, uh, obviously, because we've been doing this for a while now. So um, let's see, the Y value here of the rotate is going to go into the Z value of the rotate. And then if I rotate this one, the other one is going to be rotated. It's a little hard to see, actually, because... I didn't leave uh, very much detail on that cylinder, and obviously I'm out of focus, so let's snap my <laughs> my camera pole over here. Uh, so uh, maybe it's a little more. Okay, I see. I think I changed something else now. Pull up that focus region scale, and maybe pull up the f-stop so we can see this in focus, and maybe just for illustrating, let's pull up... Um, for example, the um, oh yeah, that was a duplicate, so I don't have that construction uh, history there. Um, what I was trying to do, by the way, once you learn learn about these buttons, for example, this these icons up here make total sense. They were kind of new to me in the beginning. So you can use these buttons, if I select the, the node that does have history, to navigate between output and input, for example. So I select the shape node, I go to the input node, that's going to take me to the polycylinder node. You can kind of traverse uh, the construction history like that if you want to. Um, yeah, but let me just do some, some changes then to this node, and um, we can see that there's actual rotation going on. We probably should have done it all the way around, but this is just a quick demo. So now we've connected two objects together. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of ways to do these things. Uh, you could script it. If that's faster, then why not? Um, there are different ways of connecting as well. Uh, sometimes even you know, when you are connecting things inside of the node editor, you will get another dialog called the um, connection editor. Let me just so show you how that works. So just to prove a point, I will delete that connection that I had, and I will go Windows, 
uh, general editors and connection editor. And that uh, is an entirely different beast, but sometimes it's really handy. So I can go down to, uh, obviously, I don't really need the shape node here, but you know that's not what I have. So I will go to, uh, you can either do them in um, default order. I tend to sometimes want these in alphabetical because it's hard to know the way that they're laid out. So I will do uh, rotate Y and plug that and you see as soon as I highlight that uh, a lot of different attributes get uh, grayed out because they're not compatible with the data type. So we have a single value and for that reason rotate is grayed out. But uh, if I twirl it out you can see that I can now connect rotate Y to rotate Z. And that's going to do the exact same thing as we did before. Like that. Um, yeah, and you can see down here just to verify that has created a link. So I hope this was a kind of an overview. If you haven't played around with the node editor before, um, we're going to do a lot more practical examples of this and we're going to plug additional things in. Um, this also poses the question of uh, proceduralism and non destructive uh, versus uh, destructive uh, use. So, one might argue, for example, that uh, Maya is not a procedural tool. Um, and so, what does someone mean when they're saying that? Well, I guess, you know, to some degree it is procedural because you can keep the construction history even though typically you're you're encouraged to get rid of construction history as much as possible uh, but let's say that I go in and I you know um, extrude this here and I um, select these edges and I bevel them and I bevel the top node here as well and I select these edges and I extrude them inwards and then I select this edge loop and this edge loop and this edge loop. So now we just made um, some kind of model. Some kind of model. Um, so one might argue that, you know, um, we have now set this up in a way uh, by not uh, deleting our history. Uh, that is going to allow us to procedurally change things around. Uh, it's a little hard to navigate this one specifically because of all of those connections to the manipulator matrix. So let me just get rid of those uh, in order for us to see a little more clearly what we're doing. This is really um, kind of overkill for this little tutorial but I just want it to be easily readable. So we can see we have an extrude phase into a bevel, into a bevel, into an extrude phase, into a bevel but everything might look dandy and you might think I can now go back and say well I didn't need all this geo I can pull down the subdivision axis for example but think for a second what's gonna happen when we do that and when you're done thinking take a look as I pull on these different attributes you see all of a sudden the entire object is changing shape and sometimes we have an alien hand grenade and sometimes we have the Tower of Babel Babylon uh, and why is that? If I go back to my default subdivision axis of 20, which I had before, everything is back to normal. And that's because this polybevel is restricted to a certain number of components. And it's going to be, you know, every component has a number. And it's not really easy right now, but I will do that in a later video. But if I lay down a plane, for example, you could just arbitrarily argue that at some point there's going to be like the first vertice and there's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and it's just going to go through the entire thing until we reach uh, 10 by 10 which is 100 and uh, you could do the same thing this is the first edge, second, third, fourth, etc. So when I say that I want to extrude this edge I'm really saying that I want to be extruding edge number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 but if I change the subdivision axes then all of a sudden everything is going to get redistributed and edge 1 and 2 and uh, you know um, maybe edge um, 
x and y are not going to be next to each other anymore, which is exactly what happened here. And then it just exponentially spirals out of control because uh, these number of components that were beveled were based on this. And that is now out of order because this number changed and then that propagates through the entire stack. So while you could say that Maya is non-destructive and to some degree procedural, you really know you really need to know what you're doing in order to keep that proceduralism. So if I were doing this in Houdini, for example, uh, I'm not going to bring up Houdini now, but I could, for example, um, feed a group node into that bevel and say, these are the components I need, um, I need to bevel. And then if something changed, I could go back to that group node and reselect and nothing would break. And that really isn't in the default functionality of Maya. But that being said, you can do a lot of those operations if you just plug in uh, the soup toolkit to your Maya installation. And soup is kind of a, like a, I often refer to it as a mini Houdini inside of Maya. And um, that's something I want to get into in later tutorials, as well as a lot of other things that are in Maya by default. But soup is going to enable us to do things like um, define group selections that we can then come back and edit in order to keep the functionality in our stack here. Because the way that it's set up now is, yeah, sure, it's non-destructive, but if I do need to actually change this subdivision number uh, in the beginning, uh, then if I do that, and let's say I really need, the supervisor comes and tells me this needs to be 12 axis, well, I might as well just delete everything else and start over with the extrudes and the bevels. While in Houdini or with soup, I could redefine the group selection and I would be good. Or I could use uh, something like um, an attribute transfer, which uh, like with a volumetric object, like a, some kind of a just a sphere, an herb sphere, I could define that anything anything inside here is going to be extruded inwards, for example. So there are a lot of ways that we can can do um, that we can do groups uh, by you know, s you know like common expressions, bounding objects, things like that. Uh, if we build, uh, if we just upgrade the functionality of Maya for a bit. So, uh, I don't know if that answers the questions, but r generally I would say that, like, in Houdini you typically work by putting down these nodes. You can work by shelf tools, but then you kind of go back and, um, and you uh, edit what you have in your node tree. While in Maya you typically... Uh, work with the shelf tools and then you have this functionality if you need it but it's kind of a caveat that you might not be able to really change it the way you might want to so oftentimes the only thing this contributes is, is um, a more complex scene that is more prone to to kind of breaking and this is actually a good illustration also of uh, something that a lot of times is the reason for things to break is that we have too much history uh, and Maya is really built to keep all of that history once the scene complexity starts building up. Um, yeah, so that's why we kind of oftentimes uh, delete all of the history, let's say, before handing over our model to a colleague that is going to assemble the main scene or something like that. But I think we're going to call it quits for now. This has been an intro to the node editor, laying down nodes and, um, you know, kind of the way things work under the hood in Maya. Um, I hope you found it useful. If there's anything you think I could improve in the videos, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if you think uh, that the video was good, then feel free to share it with someone you know who might be interested in prying under the hood inside of Maya. I would love to get your input or a thumbs up if that's the case. Uh, feel free to subscribe if you want more videos like this. I will be kind of alternating between my real flow series and this uh, series inside of Maya. So that's it for now. Uh, see you next time.